question. So uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I know more people are joining in, and we're going to be recording this session again. Uh, welcome once again to uh, Critical Care uh, uh, Clinical Update Rounds. Uh, today, we're really lucky to have um, Chris McIntyre, who's um, Robert Lindsay Chair of Dialysis Research and Innovation uh, here at Western, present uh, his take on uh, renal replacement therapy comparing SLED to CRRT and uh, how can we optimize management of uh, uh, both renal failure and uh, inflammation uh, in COVID-19 patients using extracorporeal uh, circuits. So um, without further ado, I'll pass it uh, over to Dr. McIntyre. And then we'll have a chance to ask questions at the end. So hold your questions, guys. Thanks very much. Very well. Thanks very much, Murat. Um, opportunity to talk about uh, renal replacement therapy in the COVID world. And the first thing that's probably worth saying is that there is no literature around this at the moment. So this is all being worked out in real time, often by consensus, often by application of first principles, and often by many of us who are in touch with each other around the world, trying to pull what it is we know as we go along. And what I really want to do is talk about some of the things that might be looking different to you guys with how we're managing RRT in the unit during this difficult time. And then talk a bit about some new therapies and then finish off by talking about some even newer experimental therapies that we hope to have available uh, as clinical research very shortly. So what looks the same and what's different? Well, the same is there is still CRRT, there is still PRISMA, and there is still intermittent hemodialysis. And they're still going to be used and they're still going to have the same indications. And obviously, even though we're in a COVID world, there's lots of stuff that isn't COVID. So a lot of the stuff is still the same. What I want to talk to you about though mainly is the stuff that's potentially different. I want to talk about slow extended daily dialysis as an alternate modality. I want to talk about the different filters that we might be combining with this kind of circuit, particularly uh, the mid cutoff dialysis, uh, which Theranova is the trade name. The fact that we are in the midst of potentially expanding some of our traditional indications for dialysis. I want to talk a bit about variation in terms of access and in terms of configuration, the arrangements of machines and lines, etc. Talk about a bit about indications again, but that's more to do with the research. And then the fact that the team that's delivering this has also slightly changed. At the, the VIC end, the way we've tried to do that is to introduce some more consistency by having only one nephrologist rather than the rotating nephrologists cover the ICU and try to embed into the team more effectively so we can shorten all the lines of communication. The treatments are still being delivered predominantly by the nursing team from the ALU, but they're being supported and trained by members of my KCIU research team who are from a dialysis nursing background who are there to help many of these refinements. And then the other issue is some, uh, some uh, REB approved research that's looking at the modification of how white cells work, leukocyte modulation device. And I'll talk about that last. So SLED. What is it? Slow extended daily dialysis. This has been around for an age, not least because it's almost identical to how we dialyze people at home overnight while they sleep. The key issues relating to it are that it uses conventional hemodialysis equipment with a water hookup that uses treated tap water to produce large volumes of dialysate. The pump speed is slow typically 150 to 200 mils a minute. The dialysate flow is low. It's low for us. We use between 500 to 750 mils a minute of dialysate. Obviously that's still, high, and even at the lower rates, 300 mils, that's high compared to what you'd be running on a Prisma. But it enables us in a typical treatment to use about 100 to 200 liters of dialysate in total. It lasts longer typically six to 10 hours. And within that, we cap the maximum ultrafiltration rate at no more than 500 mils an hour, often running a lot less than that, but it's never allowed to go higher than that. SLED is used on both sides of the Atlantic and is used in many units almost interchangeably with CRRT. 
One of the drivers for using it is to do with cost. Because there are no dedicated filter cells, the, the, the lines and dialyzers are much cheaper than the stuff that's designed and sold to a low volume, high cost market like critical care. And the big issue is there are no bags and the bags are some of the, the highest expense. Now the exact comparison of costs is quite difficult to do because you clearly have the money you're paying the nurse to run the machine. And then as I'll talk about a bit later, nurses can run more than one of these machines at a time. So your costs become rather dependent on how many machines are being run by one nurse. But overall, it's much less intensive, both in terms of uh, the workload, but also in terms of how well the treatment is tolerated compared to ischemic, uh, to intermittent hemo. And it's pretty much comparable to PRISMA, to CRRT, in terms of blood pressure tolerability. Now, that's for a variety of reasons, one of which is the the removal of fluid rate is typically lower. And that means there's a faster time to move fluid from the tissue space into the vascular space where it can support the cardiovascular system. But the other part that makes it more better um, tolerated is because the dialysis is running at a less efficient rate, you remove solute more slowly. And that means you have higher concentrations of solute which are also used for mobilizing fluid from the interstitial space into the vascular space. So those two things together tend to help support intravascular volume during the treatment. Now that sled as we would use it anytime, anywhere, anyhow. Um, I grew up in my ICU training using these two modalities um, uh, interchangeably. I did about two years of ICU during my fellowship. And then as a consultant in the UK, we always did a fair bit of ICU. And where I came from, the nephrologists also ran their own eight bedded level two unit, where we did everything up to but not including invasive ventilation. And SLED was our primary treatment modality in that setting. But how can we then repurpose it and modify it to be particularly suitable if we're dealing with COVID infected patients? So some of the considerations, one of which is the vascular access. Now, some of these patients will undoubtedly be chronic hemodialysis patients who've become um, infected with COVID. Even if they have a fistula, we will not be needling that fistula because of the requirements to end up being up close and personal with the patient during that process. So we want to try and make everything as remote as possible. So it's going to rely on the use of uh, of lines, and that typically is going to be necklines. These patients are probably going to need to be proned, and therefore having femoral lines where you can't see them and control them during the proning procedure runs a higher risk of disconnects or kinking or interruptions to the circuit. So broadly, we're looking at necklines, as always, preferably a right internal jugular because there's less uh, complexity in the flow of the catheter. We tend to have better patency. Patency can be challenging to maintain because you have lower pump speeds and you have longer treatment times. What we're normally relying on, particularly with the COVID patients, is standard unfractionated heparin and generous anticoagulation, not least because the COVID patients typically are very hypercoagulable and we can lose these, these circuits very, very quickly. So typically we're using a 5,000 unit heparin loading dose and running 1,000 units an hour as a maintenance. You can run sled heparin free with a lot of saline flushing, and you can also use specific regional citrate anticoagulation uh, protocols, which we have access to as well. But these are both relatively exotic and we're typically sticking with standard heparin. We can use low molecular weight heparin but the problem is because of the time we're treating, we normally need to give a booster dose around four hours into the treatment. The advantage of heparin is at least if we do have bleeds, we can always reverse it with protamine and we don't have that ability with low malfarate heparin. The other thing that you'll see us doing is using lower dialysate temperatures. 
to provide a degree of deliberate hypothermia into the patients. From our chronic patient studies, we know that's an important intervention to improve blood flow to vital organs, such as the heart and the brain during dialysis. And so we believe that has advantages in maintaining the microcirculatory flow in these patients as well. Because we've got such high dialysate volumes, very small differences in temperature between the dialysate fluid and the blood can actually end up moving a lot of thermal energy. And then we can adjust that during the treatment if we need to, and uh, add or take away warming blankets, depending on what the patient core temperature goes down to. Now, one of the advantages of SLED is because it's very gentle and because it requires very little intervention, the machines don't need to be continually dicked about with. Typically, we're looking at around three interactions over a six to eight hour treatment, and two of those are connecting and disconnecting. That allows us to try and separate the nurse from the machine during the treatment and able to just keep an observation of the filter and of the parameters on the screen, but on the other side of, of the glass, particularly depending on the configuration of the different rooms and the different bay. That has an advantage that if we can get multiple machines visible with those sight lines, you can run more machines on one, on one nurse. Very variable between different centers, varying between policies of one-to-one -one nursing to uh, UHN in Toronto, which is four to one, all the way through to Henry Ford in Detroit, where they don't even actually have a renal nurse on the floor. They set the machine up, they go away, and they're just paged if there are any issues, and then they return. There are other issues as well that we can do to maximize safety and keep the nurses remote from the treatment. And that can also be monitoring the various connections by using some of the blood leak instruments that we use for people who dialyze at home at night. And they're basically modified bedwetting alarms that if blood gets on them, they set off klaxons and sirens. And we have a number of those available with us now to be able to put, particularly if we were forced to use femoral lines and we don't have such visibility. In sled mode, if there is an unplanned disconnect, there will be an automatic lockout of the machine after around 35 to 40 mils of blood, which obviously is messy, but is below the level that would be particularly dangerous for anybody, and even below the level where a fatal air embolus would be likely to occur. So hopefully we've never seen that. I've been honest, I've, I've been at it a while, and I've never seen uh, a uh, unplanned disconnect on an intermittent platform on an ICU before. So remote dialysis, are there other things we can do to get the machine even further away? Now, the first thing to say is this is not a desirable thing to do. The further we take the machine away, the longer we need to make the blood lines, the larger the extracorporeal volume. Depending on how we can, we can put the blood lines, there's obviously issues about tripping, disconnecting, traumatizing the vascular access. So it's not a thing we want to do, but I will just show how it can be done if it had to be done. Now, the way definitely not to do it is this is the St. Mike's way. This is how they're running at the moment. So they're using standard lines. And as you can probably see, they've taken a set of one foot extensions and they've lure locked them together. So that's managed to get the machine about three inches further away, but has significantly increased the extracorporeal volume and has put a whole load of blood connections on the patient side of the air leak alarms. So there's no way of monitoring whatever's going through those connections in terms of the safety systems on the machine. We've done a lot of remote dialysis, not because it's a desirable thing to do in ICU, but because as part of our research program, we look at the blood flow and changes in the body during dialysis. And to do that, we've set up dialysis machines for patients while we have them in an MRI scanner. Now, obviously, the one thing dialysis machines really don't like is being stuck next door to a bloody great magnet. So we had to develop a series of protocols and equipment to allow us to be far more separate. And that uses specifically made and licensed 19-foot extension lines. And these lines have a pediatric volume within them. So we can trade off length against extracorporeal volume and be a meaningful distance away without meaningfully changing the circuit. 
And this is just seeing how the lines would lie in one of the ICU rooms. As you can see, pretty undesirable though, lying on the floor waiting to trip somebody up. So I say it to mention it, but in our standard configuration, we're not desiring to use this kind of extension line. So that's the circuit. What about the filter? What's different about some of the filters we're looking at? And what's different about COVID as a disease? So here you have a continuum of what happens. There's viral infection and straightforward viral pneumonia, often precipitating a need for ECMO or mechanical ventilation. Some of the patients then stop at that point. Their challenges are predominantly oxygenation. They remain relatively uninflamed, and now it's a long, slow battle with a wean. But in a significant minority of patients, they undergo a secondary severe pro-inflammatory cytokine storm response. And that recruits and activates a whole range of immunocompetent cells. It results in shock, escalating pressure re requirements, and ultimately multi-organ failure. And both the heart, kidneys, and liver have all been well described as being involved. So there is some temptation to say, could we take out some of these pro-inflammatory mediators in the middle? Can we remove cytokines? Now, cytokine removal has been tried for a long time. Obviously, you can try and do it with standard Prisma, and you can use high-volume exchanges to do it. The problem is the filters are not well designed to remove cytokines through them, and because the bag volumes, even with high volume, are low, the total amount you can remove is limited. You can't do it with standard hemodialysis because our standard hemodialysis filters cut off at about 20 kilodaltons, which is smaller than IL-6 and a lot of the other things we'd be wanting to take out. And you can target it by using specific um, adsorption cartridges, Cytosorb and some others. They have limited capacity. They get fill up with cytokines quite quickly. They're very expensive and they're not currently available in Canada. So we've been utilizing a new kind of dialyzer that was initially developed for chronic dialysis. This is the, the mid cutoff membrane dialyzer. And Theranova is the trade name of the company that has, has invented it and the only one you can have so far. So a standard dialysis membrane, the holes actually are quite small they're all different sizes and they're all different shapes. And so even though you can have a molecule that let's say is of a molecular size that should go through the holes, if it's a long skinny molecule, it won't because it's trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. So the clearance can be very unpredictable and much lower than you would like. The other issue is the membrane covers itself with protein from the patient quite quickly. That protein is positively charged and many of the things that we're trying to remove are proteins and they are positively charged. So over time, there is increasing electrostatic resistance to the movement of some of these components over uh, through the membrane. The Theranova membrane is made of the same material, but the holes are much more regularly sized and that means the average size of the hole can be made bigger. They're also rounder, and therefore they allow both larger molecules and molecules to be less impeded by these gibbs donnan electrostatic forces. So they have much higher permeability. Typically, the green here, this is the kind of molecular size you go up to. Crappy old hemodialysis is about 12, a nice expensive high flux membrane gets you to the low 20s. This kind of membrane gets you all the way up to about 45 to 50, all the way up to, but just below essential proteins, which we use albumin as our marker. IL-6 and a whole load of the other molecules of interest are all within this cutoff zone. So by combining this dialyzer with a very extended dialysis time, six to eight hours, we're hoping to be able to provide an additional therapeutic treatment for patients with COVID. And at the same time, deliver dialysis just as efficiently as if we used anything else. Now, does any of that work at all? 
Well, we don't know. It hasn't been used in this way before. But what we have done is look to see whether or not this dialyzer is different in terms of how blood flows through the microcirculation, through the little vessels. And to do that, we've set up a very, very small dialysis model. In this case, rats of about 200 grams. And then we've built little tiny adorable dialyzers that are made of the same fibers in the big dialyzer. And we've built a little tiny dialysis machine and we're able to dialyze these rats using their femoral artery and their tail vein as access for around four hours. We can then combine those rats by exposing a little bit of the muscle and with a microscope actually looking at the flow of red blood cells through the capillaries and then using that as a measure of how well is the dialysis treatment tolerated and how well is it taking out some of the chemicals that are important in keeping the flow in those little blood vessels going. So the top here in the blue, this is the animal with standard dialysis. So at the beginning, you can see lots of red blood cells flying through. After a fairly short amount of dialysis, you can see there's very little flow through these blood vessels. Top left-hand corner, you can see a bit. At the bottom in the green, this is the same animals but dialyzed using the Theranova dialyzer. This is a baseline, and this is at the same time during dialysis as the picture above. And as you can see, the whole field still has blood moving through it. And we think this is due to an enhanced clearance of some of the chemicals that normally increase adhesion and reduce flow into those uh, little blood vessels. That's what we're trying to achieve in our patients. Now that's cytokine removal. Now to go back to this picture, you see in the middle that there are pro-inflammatory cytokines, but there are also anti-inflammatory cytokines. There is a yin and a yang. And we need those good cytokines to balance off the effects of the bad cytokines. And all of these approaches are limited by the fact that they are unselective. We take the good with the bad and we hope we take more bad than good, but we don't know. So we're now looking to see whether or not we could apply a different principle where we don't take any cytokines out at all, but we target those overactive white cells that are doing all of this downstream injury. And we target them to reprogram them to, to change from villains to the good guys. Now to do that, we're looking at developing a thing, well, we have developed, called a leukocyte modulation device. What this does is it goes into an extracorporeal circuit and the patient's blood is circulated through it. The conditions within the device are such that the sheer stress, the flow at the surface between the surface and the blood vessels is low enough for the patient's white cells to stick to that surface. Within the device, the level of calcium is kept very, very low using citrate. And in that environment, the white cells, the, the pro-inflammatory white cells, change their phenotype from inflammatory to anti-inflammatory. And at that point, those white cells start to fall off the membrane and are reintroduced into the circulation and allowed to home in on the areas of inflammation. So this device has been studied in a, in a sepsis model in the pig and was shown to be highly effective and has had four, four uh, small studies in humans largely looking at reducing the length of acute kidney injury where it was found to be effective. The device was being developed by a very small company and was sold to another company and the device is, no, is not commercially available but the principles are known, not least because I worked with the guy who invented this and was able to find out some of the issues relating to the, uh, to the uh, intellectual property behind it. The device itself is actually a standard polysulfone hemodialyzer, but with the blood, instead of circulating through the blood component, it circulates through the dialysate component. So it goes on the outside of the fibers. That combined with very low pump speed allows 
the white cells to have that very low shear stress attach, be deactivated, and fall off. So the circuit is citrate coming in to reduce the calcium. Blood going through the dialysate portion of uh, a dialyzer, the white cells sticking here, being deactivated and falling off. The blood then goes through the blood portion of a standard dialyzer attached to a standard dialysis machine working in sled mode. But the purpose here is not to dialyze off any, any um, chemicals from the body, but to dialyze off the citrate. So citrate doesn't accumulate in the patient with its potential toxicity. It also allows us, because we've got calcium in our dialysate fluid, to put calcium back into the blood before it returns to the patient. And after testing, if the calcium level is still not where we want it, we can then add in further calcium with an effusion. And this circulates for between 10 to 12 hours. This device is currently being bench tested and is part of an REB submission that we should hear about today. This, when it's being used, will be purely as research, delivered by a research team in patients who've been individually consented. But we will be treating patients in a preliminary randomized controlled trial with COVID in the absence of kidney failure. So even though we're using a dialysis machine, these patients will be selected on the basis of inflammation and respiratory distress. I don't know quite when we're going to go live with this, but I'm hoping in the next couple of weeks. So this is the LMOD running. And as you can see, it looks like a dialyzer that's had the world's worst blood leak to it. But actually, the blood lines are capped off and the blood is being circulated through the dialysate portion in this citrate anticoagulated device. So to finish up, in a post-COVID world, all modes of renal replacement therapy have a place. There's something for everybody. SLED does have some advantages. The possibility that it may be better therapeutically because we can use these new dialyzers. These dialyzers are not available in a format that they can be put onto a CRT device now, even if you wanted to. And their ultrafiltration coefficient is not optimized for the high levels of convection necessary to do CVVH. But the other issue is there are operational advantages with the idea of potentially reducing the very heavy workload of running a CRT circuit in a patient with COVID in full PPE and a marked reduction in the number of interactions any nurse, dialysis or ICU nurse has to have with the renal placement therapy setup. On top of that, we may also be able to leverage these things for new therapeutic to be delivered in new ways be that cytokine removal with Theranova, or even the idea of using SLED as that circuit to be able to run an immunomodulatory device and for the first time directly target the intense neutrophil activation and infiltration that's absolutely typical of a lung injury in COVID. With that, I'll shut up and see if anyone's got any questions.